Hi everyone, my name is Devin and I work at the Worcester Public Library and today I'm really excited to have with me author Terry Farish. Thanks so much for being here today, Terry. Thank you, Devin. This is very fun to be invited. Absolutely. So Terry is the author of either The Beginning or the End of the World, winner of the Maine Literary Award for Young Adult Literature and a Boston Authors Club Finalist Award. Her novel in verse, The Good Grader, is set in South Sudan and in Portland, Maine. It was selected as an ALA Best Book for Young Adults and a winner of the Lupine Award from the Maine Library Association. Farish wrote the picture book A Feast for Joseph in collaboration with South Sudanese musician and writer O.D. Bonney and illustrator Ken Daly, which is coming from Groundwood Books in September. She's also the author of The Cat Who Liked Potato Soup, which I really like, illustrated by Barry Root, which was a bulletin for the Center of Children's Books Blue Ribbon winner. This is, this is a tale of a man and his cat who he liked, but not so as you'd notice. And it was translated into Japanese by Haruki Murakami, which has provoked the cat to travel far. Terry also volunteers for the Telling Room, supporting international teen writers. So obviously she's a busy lady and I have some questions for her. I know a little bit about you, Terry, how you've traveled many places and interacted with all sorts of people. And I wonder if this part of your life might have started when you were first working for the American Red Cross on an army compound in Vietnam. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that time and if it changed how you saw the world. It's defined how I'm seeing the world and it continues to affect me. It's one of those things you do when you're, when you're, when you're really young and you have no idea the import of it, but it, um, it, it has, defined my worldview probably and you know I, I thought about this before but it wasn't until I wrote The Good Braider which was um, about a family in particular a young girl um, who survives genocide in uh, in Sudan and, and 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 it was and I was forced to talk to people about why I wrote that book it was not my experience but I was in Portland when many, many, many people started coming from uh, that had survived the war. And I was, I absolutely found it necessary to understand this experience and talk to people who had come to Portland about their experience and, and to make sense of it myself. And I think that um, at that time, no one knew why they, why they were there. It was, a, it, was a, it was a very confusing time for the people in Maine. And, and so as, as I began to talk to people about that book, um, I'm, I'm of a different heritage, why it was so important to me to tell that story. And I, I keep going back to Vietnam and it was with the women and children. I worked for the Red Cross and we worked with the troops. So it was the, um, the army guys that were working um, um, and their lives were always in danger. And, and there was no base camp in Vietnam. Everybody was out in the boonies. And so we went out in the boonies and we supported the troops wherever they were. And I had this fierce loyalty to them. But I did also know many Vietnamese women and children because the women worked for, some women worked for the army. And, and I, they, they were my connection to the culture in Vietnam. And then when I came back to the US, years later, I studied library science and I was working in Levenster, Mass as a children's librarian. And I began to see <laughs> uh, Vietnamese families come in who had been in, who, who had come as refugees from that war and to, so telling refugee stories seems to, you know, there's so much about what we write is tapping into some vein of writers of why it's an essential story to tell. So long answer, but yes, my experience in Vietnam has shaped my, my politics and my writing. And you've definitely had an interesting life, you know, interacting with so many people, um, which leads into my next question. Your stories do include people who are going to or who have returned from war and people who are refugees. 
So even though you know people in these situations, I wonder if it's still a struggle to write about them and the situations they've been in. It is. And I think that one reason The Good Braider is in verse is that it was very, very difficult to write about Viola's life when she was still in Juba and was surrounded by soldiers. Her life had little value. And so I started writing in these lines that had um, very short lines with a lot of white space. And I think that that is how I could put myself in that situation as much as one can and, and, tell, and tell that story because it was very tense and I didn't want to write about Juba. I wanted to write about Portland and after the teenagers came, which is where all the, my interviews were with people who were in Portland, but I couldn't make sense of what was happening in Portland unless I brought the reader into the war and to show what Viola had, had survived. Now with picture books, um, I, some, this is a quote from someone, but the, the idea that children are much more than their, um, the bad things that have happened to them. They're much more than what they've survived. Children, no matter how difficult their situation, um, they're, still, they're still children and they're still discovering and they're still falling in love with things and they still desire things. So uh, I've written a couple of books about Joseph and one with O.D. Bonnie, who you just mentioned. And he is, he is the opposite of, of, of a victim. He, he's, he goes for things that he wants. And I, I want there to be a lot of joy in his, his um, assurance, uh, assurance of what he wants and his determination to make that happen for himself and his mother. You know, so even though people could be refugees, um, there can be huge joy in their lives that a picture book can tap into. Yeah, I've read a little bit about your Joseph books and he does seem like a really great character. <laughs> so obviously you've written books for different levels, you know, adults, teens, and children. Is there an age group that you feel most comfortable writing for or more fulfilling or, or do you just sort of match the story with the reader? Well, I do match the story with the reader, but I, I loved writing a novel in verse and teens are interested. Once they get over the fact that this is a poem, they really, it's a really wonderful way to bring the story a, a lot of energy and a lot of movement and a lot of emotion. So I, I loved writing in verse. Um, but much, much of my work has lately has been with kids um, during the summer, coming to summer reading programs and to library programs and recreation programs. I love working with children and taking them the Joseph books or my cat book. And they're just, they, they take away um, whatever concerns me. Um, if I can be with kids, I'm, I'm a better person. <laughs> so maybe I like writing picture books the most. <laughs> Yeah, that's fair. <laughs> I saw that you studied picture book writing with Jan Mark, a two-time winner of the Carnegie Award. I'm curious how you chose her as the person you wanted to learn from. I was living in a little village outside of Oxford. It was called Coombe Village. Um, and I was, as the, my, my husband was working in England at that time. I was very lucky to get to go to England with him. <laughs> and Jan Mark, um, stellar, wonderful writer, wonderful woman, um, was teaching at the Ox what was then the Oxford Polytechnic. And I had read her books and I, I was doing it in, I was working on a degree with Antioch college which had an international studies program so they were they were in London and Antioch is very creative and you can kind of, I had it I created an individualized degree and I wanted to write and I could um, develop tutorials with writers that I wanted to work with so I contacted this extraordinary writer and she said of course <laughs> And we began this tutorial relationship. Now she's a novelist and I was actually working on a novel with her. And she read all my very awful drafts 
and she cheered me on even if they were awful and and she became a, a good friend to me and I, I just respect her so much and her work. Sounds like she was a great teacher. Yes. So obviously you collaborate with different writers and also illustrators who are from different countries and cultures and how do you think this has affected your writing? Oh, I have worked with the most wonderful, wonderful illustrators. Um, I feel so very lucky. Now, the way publishing works is that I don't really directly collaborate with the illustrator. They um, get the story and then the illustrator creates the story in a visual way. For instance, with the cat, um, Barry Root added all kinds of things to capture the man's personality. Like he put that um, abandoned toilet out in front of his house and all those things to show and, and put the sign on it, junk mail, just put it in here. And all these ways to capture that he, he was not a, a lovey, huggy man. He was a gruff, irascible guy. Uh, so I just feel just so lucky that Barry Root illustrated that book. And, and Ken Daly has done gorgeous work with the Joseph books. Um, but I only get to talk to them after it's done. <laughs> and, and, and I have since and can show my, my respect for their work. Working with OD was a very new experience for me because we were joint writers. And I had the character Joseph but o, uh, O.D. and I developed A Feast for Joseph, which is the new book, um, together. And it, it, it's, it's a book that wouldn't have existed without each one of us because we brought some, each brought something very different to it. Um, O.D. grew up as a refugee. He was in South Sudan during the war and he left to go to Uganda and um, there was a refugee camp there that was an, uh, with the Acholi people, and O.D. himself is Acholi, which is a tribe in Uganda and um, Sudan. And when we talked about writing together, he, he gave me a folktale to kind of explain his culture, and it was very much about... Uh, pride in one's culture and, and being a, always honoring of one's culture. And that got very much into the story of Joseph about a boy who wanted to have a feast with a choli food. And he remembers the awal, which is his musical instrument he played when he would, well, that he, yeah, he played, but O.D. Bani played because that's something that's a memory of his when he was in um, Tangwali, which is the refugee camp that he was in. Now, he changed everything. So I, I had experience shaping the details into a story for, a, for a Western readers as well as others. Um, and then he brought all this wonderful Acholi detail and uh, gave the heart of a little boy who needed to honor his people. That sounds great. I can't wait to see that one when it comes out. Thank you. Yeah. So I don't know much about picture book writing, and I was just curious how long it takes from your first idea all the way through to publication with all the steps in between, you know, with the illustrator and all that. I know. They're so small. They only have sometimes 32 pages. Um, but they're not quick. <laughs> they're not quick. Um, I think we, we were going to talk also a little bit about the challenge of writing a picture book. And you know, sometimes um, they're tapping into some vein in you and you don't know it yet. So sometimes you, get, you have this fragment of an idea and you think you might work with it but you might work with it over a long time before you find what, where it's really hitting you, hitting you in your, in your heart and your bones. Like this is something that um, is an honest and genuine emotion. And this picture book can hold this emotion. So I think it's like poetry. Picture books, many of them are like poetry, but it's 
the kind of precision of language like a poem and I don't write anything fast and so they can take me many years many years like I had a scrap of in my journal from when I lived in England it was about an old man and his cat that was I came back from England and 1986. <laughs> the cat who liked potato soup came out in 2003. Yeah. So it was it was steeping <laughs> for many years. And I'm sure there are picture book writers that work a lot faster than that. <laughs> well, I'm glad you wrote The Cat Who Liked Potato Soup, even if it took a while. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So I think there are people out there who think that writing a children's book is easy because kids like anything. And I was curious what you would say to those people. Well, I think it's one of the hardest things to write. There's so much that needs to come together in a, in a way that you, you see the finished product and it's just all together. But there's, um, um, there's, there's the rhythm of the language, there's the tension, there's the and a possibly a repetition that works, like with the old man, um, he loved her, but not so as you'd notice. And so sometimes it's finding this, this phrase that you can play through it in such a way that you don't irritate people, but it's kind of funny. And you also understand the old man and you understand the cat's frustration. So you're building character as well as music, as well as, as just a deep invitation into, into a story. No, so I, I think that some, some of the best picture books are ones that um, can bring all those parts together and then find and then work with an illustrator who gets it and can tell the story visually. Yeah, I There's an example, another example I can give. I, because of my work in Vietnam, I've been reading widely of Vietnamese American writers for adults, for children, and also for, for picture books, for picture book readers. And there's a new picture book writer, his name is Bo P, and he's Vietnamese American, he's a poet. Poets are kind of, um, that talent can really be magic for a picture book. But he wrote a book called A Different Pond, which is a poem, but it's a really, really a cross section of life of a little boy. And once again, he's tapped into this vein of himself as a child. And that's what's important about mo almost all picture books is they tap into something that's deeply important to the writer. And that's why you feel this tug um, when you feel the emotion of the story. And so Bo P does this with um, a, a different pond. And you can tell that this is a love song to his parents, just a, a, a book of gratitude for what they did for him so that he could thrive as a little boy in America. I have to look that up, that sounds great. I bet you have it, it's wonderful. <laughs> well, if you've enjoyed this conversation with Terry as much as I have, make sure that you sign up for her virtual workshop writing a picture book that's going to be on Saturday, August 21st from 2.30 to 3.30. Maria Popova describes picture books as stories that tackle with elegant simplicity such complexities as uncertainty, loneliness, loss, and the cycle of life. Please join author Terry Farish to explore components that help the picture book sing. In this one hour workshop, with a focus on writing the picture book, participants will sample many kinds of stories that are a part of the genre. Terry will also offer prompts and guidelines for participants to write their own picture book. Thanks so much, Terry. I've really enjoyed talking with you. Thank you, Devin. I'll see you soon. Mm -hmm.